Hi, everyone. Um, I've been telling everybody that I am going to talk about dating and engineering, and then people ask me, seriously? It's like, yes. No, you're telling a joke, right? So what's your title? Like dating and engineering, and they say, oh, these don't correlate. They never come together. So I went on Google and said, OK, dating and engineering, nothing. So Google is usually very, um, you know, it speaks all the time. So instead of and, it turned dating and engineering, which is an and engineer, which is still pretty good. But that's not really what I wanted to talk about. And I kept asking my students, and most of them said, no, it has nothing to do with it. Actually, um, I don't even have a date. And, and I said, are you kidding me? But every once in a while, somebody would look at me and say, yeah, actually, these two are very correlated. I'm failing all my classes, and I fail every single date that I take. I was like, oh my gosh, OK, maybe that is my title. So um, to start with, I've been teaching design. I've been teaching engineering for almost 20 years now, since I was in Brazil. And uh, when people design things, they have ideas. I'm very hopeful that most of you have tried making things at home, origami, putting together furniture. But um, usually, you have an idea about something, and hopefully, you don't get married to that one idea. Actually, I used to teach only that. Do not marry your first idea. And people would look at me and say, what are you talking about? And I would say, well, did you marry your first girlfriend, the one from kindergarten? I said, no, you? OK, that's what. So life is not always multiple choice. But when life is multiple choice, it's much better. So if you only have one choice in life, you can only be here today. Ew. Hopefully you have like five ideas on how to go to the beach, how to go um, on a date, how to go to TEDx. And you picked to be here you know, TED stage. So this was hopefully your best choice. And that's the idea in engineering design. Actually, I even taught in Korea these two uh, people who were uh, jewelry designers. And I told them exactly the same thing. Hopefully, you don't design the first jewelry that you think of. You think of 100 of them, and then design just your best one. This is the best way of going forward, be it in engineering, be it in dating. So, um, so there you go. If you go home today and you don't watch the rest of my talk, I highly recommend not watching it. Just think about never marrying that one first idea. Never marrying that one first girlfriend or boyfriend. Hopefully you have a lot. Um, actually, I know about the girlfriend and boyfriend deal, not because I'm an, I'm an expert in dating. By the way, I talked to uh, Dr. Christy Hartman. If you ever need some dating advice, go read her books. She wrote five books on dating. I have, re I have written zero and read zero. But I'm Brazilian. So Brazilians are really good in soccer. Even though, don't ask the Argentinians. Don't ask the Italians. Don't ask the Germans. But we're the best ones in soccer. Um, every single Brazilian is really good soccer coach. You can ask me about soccer anytime. Uh, the second thing Brazilians are good at is samba dancing. But I'm not good at that, so I don't qualify. Uh, the third thing Brazilians are good at is being experienced in being mugged. So I have a lot of experience with that. The fourth thing is dating. So this is absolutely the most important piece for, this, for the purpose of this talk. In Brazil, if you want to say that you dated somebody, you don't even use three words like here in, in uh, English. You have to say a one-night stand. You had a one-night stand. In Brazil, you just need one word. And the verb is ficar. So as a teenager, when you go to school Monday, the first, sent, the first question people ask you, who did you date? There is not even a, a present tense in that verb. It's always in the past. So every time you date, it's gone. So the next day you go, who did you date yesterday? So you don't even remember the name of the guy half the time. But at least you get the experience of dating one day, dating the next day, dating the next day. If you never went to Brazil as a teenager, or if you never lived in Brazil for 30 years like I did, maybe you can watch Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day is exactly like that. The main character, Phil, wakes up every day the same day until he gets it, that he wants to really date this girl. But he tries to kill himself four times, and he's still there. And uh, he does all this stuff. And that's the this, uh, idea of dating that's very central to engineering. So in engineering, if you've ever done a project that you really want to work, you fail, and you do it again the next day. You fail, and you do it again the next day. So you wake up for a whole year, the same day. Your project's still not working. I promise you. The day that works, you own it. So you made it work yourself for a whole year, 
finally you get it. So um, because I'm Brazilian, I can speak as an engineer who not only dated a lot, but also broke a lot of things. So I'm going to tell you now, not really that I am Brazilian, but that I'm an engineer. And most people turn to me and say, what kind of engineer? And my answer, or my most common answer is, the one that breaks everything? It's like, well, aren't engineers supposed to like drive trains and fix stuff? It's like, yeah, every once in a while I drive a train for Christmas, or <laughs> I, um, I fix stuff like, uh, I don't know, I turn the light on. But um, <laughs> mostly I break things. I'm really, really good at breaking things. And I've been good at breaking things since I couldn't walk. So say my parents. Um, so I thought that this was a trait, not of all Brazilians, but only of me. So my brother and sister used to look and say, do you have a brain problem? And that's what I ask my daughter nowadays, because you keep breaking all these things. And I would tell them, I'm not really breaking. I'm just trying to um, see what's inside. And so to see what's behind a toy, to see what's behind a computer, you've got to open it. And by opening it, what happens is that you break it. So a screwdriver is always inside my backpack to this day. So since I was a kid, it's, lipsticks don't make it to my backpack. So I thought this was a, a particular trait and, uh, until I had a daughter. And here she is. She can barely um, talk. She has diapers on. And we had to put up gates for her. And by, mind you, this is already the second gate. So if you see this first one, and we're not sure if she wanted to put the gate up or take the gate down. I think it's down. Um, and I said, OK, maybe this is not only me who likes breaking things. Maybe there's something else there that we all would like to see what's inside a laptop. And so this is uh, my daughter several years later. And here was a screen of a laptop. And if you've never seen a keyboard from the back, I highly recommend. Next time you buy a MacBook Air, open it, take the keyboard out. It's really cool. So um, <laughs> this, this is absolutely what she did. So she was in kindergarten. She was all interested in opening up stuff. And I said, OK, maybe other people like that too. Let's go ask. So sure enough, she starts Girl Scouts. And Girl Scouts are, are, Girl Scouts are all arts and craftsy, like pens, pencils. Uh, and it's like, OK, can we come with screwdrivers? And they said, sure. So OK, let's bring 10 screwdrivers. Long story short, two years later into this, we have done this with 500 kids, more or less 50 different Girl Scout troops, and they all love it. They love so much in the first day that I show up and I say, let's open up some toys. Let's take a look at the brains of these toys. And they say, yes, yes, oops, let's do that. And sure enough, weeks later, usually I receive keyboard pieces, speakers from their parents' cell phones, and capacitors from, uh, capacitors from uh, voltage regulators. You know those little boxes where you plug your computer in that you eventually throw away? Gift to us, and we open them up. And they, they work afterwards sometimes. Anyway, and you see, so, so you see what we get to do, which is have fun with kids all the time, uh, make them great future engineers with just a screwdriver. It's way better than a pen and a pencil, trust me. Um, so I do that for a living. And then by the time these uh, kids get to college, I tell them, OK, now you've got to do the same thing, except not with somebody else's design. The catch here is when you're opening up a laptop from somebody who made the laptop, you're really interested in breaking. If you make your own laptop, you say, oh, no, it's very, very, very sensitive. Don't touch it. And so my students, when they make a robot, when they make a project, when they become engineers, all of a sudden, they are super scared of breaking these things because they made them. I am here to tell you to be courageous and break everything that you make <laughs> so that you understand where it breaks. So it's very important in engineering to not only design something, but to test it. And this test, have you ever asked somebody who says, I'm a test engineer. No, they say, I'm a test engineer. Ew. I, they hate being test engineers. I would love to be a test engineer to break everything, really. And uh, so when you design something, or when my students design something, I'm always asking to see the project failing. I need 
to see how people react to failure. This, these best projects, and I have two to show you, are students who not only tried really hard, but showed me that they tried the first time, they failed, they learned from that, and their project became much better because they learned from their failures. I really hope to pass this one message along um, with these uh, two videos. The first one is a self-balancing bike. This long time, long time ago, it was in 2008, they uh, designed the mechanical pieces, they put together a bike, and they designed the electronics and the control system to make the bike stand by itself and walk by itself. This is not an easy task. I hope you enjoy this one minute video. Oops, here. Okay, so the second video is a more recent one, just from last year, and I have a, uh, an NSF project to design devices to help people with disabilities. If you have ever known somebody on a wheelchair who has limited movement in their uh, upper limbs, they take a long time to eat, or they have to have somebody to help them feed themselves. So we've been trying to put together a feeding arm, so it's a simpler robot, and yet it's something that can scoop up food and serve to your mouth. You understand the problem, right? So it is reasonably sim simple to explain, but scooping motion in a robot's not a, a simple thing, and finding somebody's face if you don't know where around the table the person is, it's also not that simple. So it's another one minute video, it, and I promise the last video, um, but I hope you, you see, again, I hope you see the failures. They are really, really cool. So, oops, okay, maybe th this was a failure. Yeah, I can absolutely break it. Let's do it. All right, so um, I'll leave you with one last engineering principle. So I gave you one in the, in the beginning of this talk, which is don't marry your first idea. 
The second one is fail early and often. And again, people look at me and say, like, what? Are you really telling us you failed? Yes, of course, yes. So we have this competition that we play with engineering students, but works really well with kindergartners too, which is you give them some spaghetti and warm marshmallow, and for the kindergartners say, don't eat the, sp the spaghetti, don't eat the marshmallow. And you have to build a tower with the spaghetti. It's really thin spaghetti. And you put the marshmallow on top. It's called the marshmallow challenge, if you want to look it up. There's a TED talk about that. Um, and it's really interesting that our engineering students who are uh, in their last year, they sit down and write equations for how it goes up. But, and I keep saying this, the marshmallow is on the floor. It needs to go up. It needs to go up. They have 18 minutes. And here's what happens with the very, very engineering-minded people who are book smart. They never touch the marshmallow, never touch the marshmallow, never touch the spaghetti. One minute before the 18 minutes, they put together all the spaghetti, put the marshmallow on top, and what happens? It goes down and they lose it. The kindergartners are the people who are very, very hands-on oriented. They say, okay, let me take a look at the spaghetti. And as soon as they put the two spaghetti in the marshmallow, flops. Spaghetti, marshmallow, down. Say, Oops, let's put another spaghetti. Third spaghetti, marshmallow, down. Fourth spaghetti, marshmallow, up. By 18 minutes, they have the tallest possible tower. So this is what I see every time I ask people to do experiments. And mind you, I bet against any experiment that works the first time around. All my graduate students hate me for that, but that's fine. Um, so they come and say, oh, this super experiment just worked. I bet a nickel it didn't. So then they go back and have to prove it. By the 10th time, then they really got it. Then it really works. Then you publish the paper. Then you make the video. But then you show everything that didn't work also, because then you're a much better engineer for that. And I understand they really understood something. So, oopsie. Um, so the thing that I'm going to leave you with is for you to be daring enough, to be courageous enough, to be vulnerable. That's what uh, Dr. Brene Brown has been saying for four years now that she learned. People who are um, connected, wholehearted, they usually are vulnerable. That's the main characteristic. The same thing is true in engineering. Potentially the same thing is true in dating, I don't know, in life. Um, which is, if you're, if you're daring enough to be willing to fail, and if you fail early and often, and you learn from that, you're a much better person. You're definitely a much better engineer. So thank you.